him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and who has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear fellow crossbearers of our Lord, a choice had to be made. And Chad didn't know what to think. As he sat up in his hospital bed, tears streamed down onto his gown. The voice of the doctor still ringing in his ears. Your kidneys are failing. We don't know how much longer you have to live. His brother Ryan, when he heard the news, he practically teleported himself to Chad's bedside. And he laid down a self-sacrificing commitment. Chad, I want to help you. Let me donate one of my kidneys to you. When Chad heard this, his, his face kind of snarled up. And he just said, no way, Ryan. I can't let you do that. Do you realize the risk of that operation could be? You could lose your life for me. I'm not worthy for you to do that. Just let it go. Ryan persisted. He kept encouraging his brother, please, let me do this for you. And eventually, that persistence paid off. The operation happened. The operation was a success. Because Ryan would not take no for an answer from his brother, Chad was given a whole new outlook on life. The story, it kind of takes you to somebody else too, doesn't it? Somebody who, despite all the times that maybe we thought we weren't worthy enough for him to save us, that we maybe thought at times that we didn't need him to save us, he wouldn't take no for an answer. Jesus took up the cross, and he made it a must to save you and save me. And now he also gives us the joyful must to take up our own crosses and to follow him. But for the disciples in our text, the cross was... Probably the furthest thing from their mind. They had walked around with Jesus. They had marveled at the things he had done. Their logic betrayed them as they saw a couple loaves of bread and a few fish feed the hunger of thousands. Their eyes were blinded by what they actually could see. When in Bethsaida, just before this, they saw a blind man see the world for the very first time. And now their journey with the Lord trudged on. In fact, from Bethsaida to the place in our text, they trudged on 32 miles. That's from taking a hike from here at Mount Olive to Powers. And they finally reached their destination at Caesarea Philippi. Now, the city wasn't like other cities in Israel. In fact, the city was known more for what was wrong with it than for what it actually was. The city was known for sexual atrocities. It was known for being the mecca of sexual gods and fertility. And they finally reached perhaps the culmination of it. It was this big cave, and there was little temple-like crevices kind of built into the rock of that cave, where little tiny gods took up residence. And the disciples must have just been looking around at this place and thinking, out of all places to go, Lord, why here? And as their heads are <coughs> swiveling from side to side, Jesus kind of bursts into the question. Who do people say that I am? Perhaps kind of caught off guard a little bit. I mean, Jesus, why are you asking us this question? You can kind of hear it in their answer. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still, others one of the prophets. And as they're saying this, you can almost picture Jesus' face dropping. Because he knew this answer was coming. Because most of the people that Jesus ministered to, it, they barely reached a half millimeter to the depth of who he actually was. They saw Jesus as, he's a good guy. Very good moral teacher, he leads a good life. He's that person that, if everything, if everything else is falling apart, he's that guy to turn to. He's like the perfect last resort. And that's where it stopped. But Jesus wasn't quite done with his line of questioning. In fact, he makes the next question a lot more personal. And he looks at his disciples and he says, But what about you? Who do you say that I am? 
not that there were spotlights around back in 0 BC or 30 BC or 80, but you had to feel that glare. Like, the disciples knew that this was a question that was meant just for them. These 12 men who would be the future torchbearers of the gospel. And you can almost imagine Peter, who, as we know, is a very kind of excitable kind of guy. He kind of jumps up on behalf of the whole group, and he says, You are the Christ! And Peter was, he was right in the money, he was right. They aced the pop quiz. So what's stopping the disciples, if they know who he is, why don't they go out and, and preach the good news? Except that's not what Jesus says next, is it? In fact, he says to them, do not tell anyone about me. Jesus, we just answered that question right. We've, we've been following you for almost three years now, and... You still don't trust us to tell people about you? The thing was, as much as they were perplexed, Jesus wasn't quite done with instructing them. Because right after Jesus says that, he goes on to say perhaps the most beautiful words that we could ever hear. And he lays out the gospel plan. He says, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days, rise again. There's no play by Shakespeare, there's no novel by J.K. Rowling that can match these beautiful, these infinitely impactful words of Jesus, the gospel. And when the disciples hear this, they start jumping for joy, belting hymns of thanksgiving, bowing down to their Savior. Well, no, that's actually not at all what they did. In fact, Peter kind of comes up to Jesus and he puts his hand on his shoulder and he kind of turns him away from everybody else. And he says to him, Lord, what are you talking about? In fact, it says, he rebuked him. Lord, a, a cross? A cross is an execution device. A cross is for the scum of the earth, not the light of the world. Lord, you, you're the Messiah. You're, you're the Christ. You're the one who's supposed to restore Israel and bring us back to the power we used to have, and we, your disciples, we're supposed to rule with you. There's no room in that for a cross. Lord, don't do this. And Jesus kind of, you can almost imagine him kind of bumping Peter off his shoulder and saying, get behind me, Satan. Because you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. See, Peter was so focused on himself and what he wanted. Because when he looked into his future, he saw maybe a crown, maybe royal robes. He sat in the court of the royal king, the Messiah of Israel. But Jesus had something much more profound, something much more meaningful in mind for both Peter and for you and me. The things of God, the things that give us eternal life, salvation, Yet there's no mistake in the fact that Peter's reply, or Jesus' reply to Peter, that hurts. I mean, can you imagine standing there and Jesus calling you Satan in front of your brothers, in front of the people that you are closest to, your best friends? And for what? I mean, Peter, didn't he just care about Jesus' life? Didn't he love him so much that he couldn't bear the thought of Jesus dying on a cross? But we have to look deeper this morning. Because what Peter was doing is he was tempting Jesus with the same temptation that the devil gave him in the wilderness. Lord, I know you came here to say, but do these people really deserve it? Lord, you could have all the pomp and the circumstance of this life, and instead you want, what, to go to a cross of disgrace and of naked shame? But do you remember what Peter said? Or what Jesus said to Peter right before he rebuked him, he said, the Son of Man must. What Peter and his disciples couldn't grasp was that their denial of Jesus was really a denial of his very will. Because Jesus' will was so focused, so embedded on the idea of saving us. From that light in the Garden of Eden, now to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had worked together the perfect blueprint to give you and me heaven forever. And by Peter rebuking him, he was basically saying to Jesus that he didn't want to be saved. And that's not at all what Jesus wanted. 
if Jesus were to listen to Peter, then we have no reason to be in this church this morning. We have no hope in the world. But Jesus made the cross a must, even when his own friends discouraged him from doing it. He made a, the cross a must to save you and to save me. In fact, Mark tells us that Jesus spoke plainly about this. This was something that was so easily um, brought to mind when he talked about this. This was something that Jesus cared about and thought about every single day. And yet, Peter's not the only one who is tempted by Satan. He's not the only one who Satan whispers in his ear saying, you know, Jesus is the Son of God, I'll give you that. But can't Jesus just be the God that you want him to be? Or maybe Satan comes at you with a little bit of a different approach and he says, you think the Son of God who created everything, who is a God of everything, cares about that sin that you're struggling with all the time? You think he cares about that relationship that just can't seem to get together? And with these questions, Satan leads us to think of Jesus in a me-focused kind of way. He wants us to think of Jesus in a way that we want him to be, and not the Savior that he really is for us, which is far better than what we could ever have imagined. The truth is that Jesus made it his sole purpose to save you. He didn't think about himself. He was constantly thinking of you and me. Even though we sometimes think we don't need him, Jesus made it a need to save us. And we can embrace a Savior that will always bring us back into his arms. A Savior who made the cross a must and who continues to serve us and watch over us today. So we get that about Jesus' cross. We get that without the cross there'd be no meaning in life. But there's a second half to this. Our cross. Do they matter? And if they do, how is it possible for us to actually have happiness and joy while we carry those crosses? Well, let's travel back to Jesus. So Jesus had just told his disciples why he was here. He told them his mission. But he had yet to open up one immense treasure, the treasure of the cross for Christians. And for this, it wasn't just for his disciples, it was for everyone who followed him. Now these followers were people like Martha and her sister Mary and Lazarus who had gone with Jesus and his disciples all over and they had found places for him to sleep, things for him to eat. These followers, including you and me, and picture yourself standing there. Picture yourself looking into Jesus' eyes when he says what seems to be sobering words, when in reality, they're some of the most incredible words that we can hear in this life. He says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Maybe with a touch of sadness and a tinge of despair, you can almost imagine the deafening silence that envelops this group of Christians. The cross. It's not just for Jesus, but it's for me. The cross is apparent to see a child that clearly is not going in the right direction. And you lovingly bring the word of God to them and you tell them, this is the better plan that Jesus has for you watching them slam that front door as they leave. The cross of being at work and not joining in in the dirty jokes and the gossip and having people call you Mr. or Mrs. High and Mighty. The cross of believing in a religion that so many people despise, so many people think is a simpleton religion. The reality, no cross, no Christian. How do these crosses look to me and to you? Well, they kind of shatter us. I mean, they're terrifying. But yet, who we really are, who you really are, in Christ, the new person that's within you, can't get enough of that cross. It fascinates us. Yeah, our sinful nature is going to buck and rock and throw itself to try to get rid of it. And Jesus says, you can get rid of it, but if you do, you're not going to be with me forever. But our true selves, we see the value of it. Because in our suffering, we get VIP clearance into the throne room of God. 
we get clearance into a beautiful, lasting, growing relationship with Jesus as he walks with us as we bear our crosses in this life. Jesus smiles at us as we do this because the cross is not about how painful it is. It's not about what you or me are capable of, but it's about what Jesus is capable of. Even when those slivers of persecution dig into our shoulders, Jesus gets up, he dips underneath that cross with us, and he walks with us. Because as we carry this cross, we're surrounded by God's grace. This cross is not meant to demean you or to give you pain, but Jesus has in mind for you to be uplifted. Because in this cross, not only do you get closer to your Savior, but your testimony, your witness, goes out to all the world like a million sirens. This is what being a Christian is about. Because this world has so much pain, so much heartbreak, and yet the cross gives us the eternal comfort of being close to our Savior. Jesus beams with pride every time that you carry that cross for Him. And He's with you every step of the way. It reminds you that our real perspective is on heaven above and not on earth below. Your cross is a must, and your cross is full of joy. When we survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, our souls rejoice. The God of all did not give up on you, even when so often we give up on ourselves, we throw ourselves into a pit of despair thinking we're not good enough. We're not worthy to carry such a beautiful status symbol as a cross. But he made his undying purpose, his necessary mission, a must, to bring you into his arms forever. He gave you an award to carry a cross. And yes, it's going to be hard, and yes, those slivers dig in, but yet he comes to you, and he picks out those slivers, and he heals you. And at times, when you trip over that cross, he picks up the cross with you, and he might even carry you, too. Because he'll guide us. And in fact, our crosses don't even belong to us. They're borrowed. To whom will they go? To where will they go? To Jesus in heaven. His next gift for you is something much smaller. A key. A key to your heavenly home where you belong. Amen.